Hello and welcome to the AIM webinar series. My name is Mike Allen and I serve AIM Inc. as their member engagement manager. AIM is the trusted worldwide industry association for the automatic identification industry. For nearly half a century, AIM has provided unbiased information, educational resources, and standards to providers and users of these technologies. AIM membership provides access to an insider's perspective on trends and opportunities, along with a voice in shaping the growth and future of the industry. AIM member benefits include education, advocacy and community, as well as a role in creating industry standards through collaboration. AIM is an investment in your future. Before the presentation starts, I'd like to direct your attention to your monitor to review a few housekeeping items. First, you will notice that you are muted throughout the presentation. Please do not use the raise hand option during this webinar presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, please click the chat icon on the top right of your screen. After this, you'll see a chat dialog box at the bottom right of your screen. Make sure in the Send To box you select AIM Inc. and then in the box below type your question. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can after the presentation. Today's presenter is Mark Roberti, the founder and editor of RFID Journal. Mark will be presenting, Will RFID Be a Niche Technology Forever? AIM would like to thank RFID Journal for their support of today's event. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mark. Okay, Mike, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to thank AIM for uh, inviting me to do this webinar. We have uh, had a close partnership with AIM to try to grow the RFID industry um, going back many, many years. So um, I appreciate all of you joining us. Um, <clears throat> the reason for the title of my presentation is um, uh, a few months back, uh, about six months ago, I bumped into an old friend uh, from the RFID industry, someone I've known for um, close to 15 years. They started their company around the time I started RFID Journal. And uh, he mentioned that uh, he was thinking about uh, getting out of the RFID industry. And he said, you know, it's going to be a niche technology for forever. And uh, I started thinking about that, and um, and, and so um, I today I'd like to present my thoughts um, and the evolution of my thoughts about um, about this question. So the short answer is um, it really depends on uh, the solution provider community about whether uh, it, it remains a niche technology forever or um, or expands more widely. Um, so if you want to uh, jump off now, you've got the short answer, but I'd like to go into a bit more depth uh, about why um, why I think that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the evolution of my thinking over the years. Um, I'll provide a little bit of background on the RFID market. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the inefficiencies uh, that, that, that exist in the world today across all industries. Um, I'm going to talk about the size of the RFID market. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the technology adoption life cycle uh, based on Jeffrey Moore's model. And uh, I'll look at where we are now in terms of that adoption model and then how do we get to mass adoption um, if we can at all. So way back in uh, 2002 when I started RFID Journal, um, I wrote that one day every object on Earth will be manufactured with an embedded RFID tag or have an RFID tag placed on it. Um, I was pretty confident of that description uh, or, or that view because I believed it was the only way to track and manage physical objects um, in the real world without a lot of labor costs. So just to go through some of uh, the, the waste that, uh, that, that exists in the world, um, if you look at hospitals, uh, they lose on average $5,000 worth of equipment per bed per year. That's a lot, $5,000. So you have a 1,000-bed hospital, um, you're talking about $5 million in lost equipment every single year, year after year. 
And you say, well, why is that? Why, why do hospitals lose stuff? Why should that be? Well, um, there's lots of examples, and if you talk to people in the healthcare industry, they, they will tell you all kinds of stories. So um, sometimes, for example, small uh, pieces of equipment get uh, bundled up with laundry, uh, get thrown into a hamper somewhere, um, and you know when they arrive at the laundry company, they don't bother to return an item. They don't, may not know it's a $5,000 item or a $700 item, so they just throw it away. Um, in other cases, people take wheelchairs out. Um, someone finishes surgery, uh, they take a wheelchair out to the car, um, and instead of returning the wheelchair back to the hospital, they say, hey, you know what, we may need this at some point. They throw it in the trunk, um, thinking, you know what, we're paying a lot of money for hospital fees, at least in the U.S. Um, other people have told me that nurses hide equipment in the ceiling tiles, so they have uh, done some renovation and found um, monitoring equipment in the ceiling tiles. And the reason nurses do that is because they spend a lot of time looking for items, 60 minutes per week uh, looking for items. Um, and so sometimes if they know they're going to need a piece of equipment tomorrow or in the afternoon, they may stick it somewhere so that um, they can find it later. Hoarding is a very uh, common problem and, a reason that, uh, and the reason people hoard is there's no visibility into the location of assets. So asset utilization rates for most medical equipment is below 50%. In fact, um, if you ask uh, any, ho any um, uh, hospital what's the asset, what's, what's the utilization rate of your incubators, 99% um, of percent of them can, can, can't even tell you. Um, they have no idea because they don't know how many incubators they have, they don't know where they are, they don't know when they're in use, they don't know when people are, 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 are looking for them. Um, so so the, the asset utilization rate is extremely low. Um, and, you know, using a um, real-time location system, you can get that asset utilization rate up um, and save uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in capital expenditure. You can re reduce the losses and so on. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is uh, one of the wealthiest industries on earth, but uh, it loses, on, uh, according to the Center for Medicines in the Public Interest, it, pharmaceutical manufacturers lose about $75 billion per year due to the sale of counterfeit drugs. And uh, I saw an article years ago in the New York Times saying that in some countries in Africa, 90% of the drugs uh, that are sold are counterfeit. It's an extraordinary number. Uh, it's not just drugs, though. Toys. Uh, so people manufacture counterfeit toys. Um, and I, I heard a speaker speaking at, a, a, at the Toy Industry Expo one year when I was speaking there, and he said that in some European countries, as much as 50% of the toys on the shelves are counterfeit. Um, and the reason we have such large numbers of counterfeit items uh, is that we can't track and manage things very efficiently. Um, we don't have chain of custody. We don't know where drugs went from one person to another. Um, I have heard stories that large um, athletic shoe manufacturers have found counterfeit sneakers in their own stores. So that's how pervasive uh, this problem really is. Lost luggage, uh, nearly 30 million bags are mishandled by the airlines each year, uh, costing about $3 billion. Um, and mishandled doesn't mean lost, um, it just means maybe your bags went to Seattle and you went to Dallas. Um, but it costs a lot of money to get that bag back to a person and, and sometimes you know you actually have drivers drive uh, 50 miles from an airport to deliver a bag because it was mishandled. Um, and again, this is largely due to the inability to track and manage large numbers of real uh, physical objects in the real world. Missing containers. So if you look at the auto industry, 76% of automakers and parts companies have issues related to lost or missing containers. If you were at our RFID Journal Live event um, this year in, in uh, Orlando in May and saw the ter terrific presentation um, by Johnson Controls, um, the speaker said that um, 
our best estimate for the number of containers we own is between four and five million. Um, that's a very large uh, difference between having four million and five million, um, but at this point the company doesn't even know uh, how many they have. Uh, so, so uh, if a container is not where it's supposed to be, um, this can really this can result in uh, operational downtime. And 30 percent, 36 percent of companies said they uh, had operational downtime due to um, the lack of containers. And annually, about 7% of parts containers in the auto industry are replaced annually. 7% is probably low. I talk to a lot of folks and most say it's closer to 10% in, in a lot of different industries. Uh, when you have re reusable transport items, they get stolen. Um, just an interesting aside, you know, as a journalist, you talk to a lot of people over the years and, and you hear a lot of different stories. Uh, but I was speaking to someone in the airline industry and they said um, they lose ULDs, universal loading devices. So those are the big semicircular um, aluminum containers that luggage are put in, and then and then those those ULDs are put on the, put on a plane. Um, and I said, well, what would someone do with a ULD? Why would someone take that? And and how do they go missing? And he said, well, he said that. Um, one time he was flying over uh, Africa, leaving Nairobi or uh, I forget the exact city, and he said he looked down and he saw an entire city of ULDs. So people turn these things upside down, cut holes in them, and use them um, as temporary shelter to live in. So um, lots of inefficiencies, but again, all goes back to the inability to track and see where these things are, where they're going, um, where they've they've been. Um, I often hear, by the way, the other side of the story, which is you talk to a senior executive and they say, no, 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 we, we, we know exactly where our containers are. We know exactly how many we have. We know exactly where they are at every moment. We know everything about everything that's going on in our operations. And um, of course, you know, it's, it's utter nonsense. Uh, co companies don't have this, uh, this level. Hello? Can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so people say that oh you know we have tremendous uh, we have tremendous visibility and we have tremendous accuracy and and of course um, it's not true but a lot of times you don't have the data to even determine what your you know what what your accuracy rate is just another little anecdote I interviewed a guy from um, uh, a hospital up in Boston very well known teaching hospital and he said we went to tag our gurneys and uh, we thought we had 200 and we had bought 200 tags for the gurneys we got them all all together, and when we when we got them together, we found out we had 300 gurneys. So people don't even know what they have. Never mind what their asset utilization rate, what's going missing, and so on. And to me, when I first started RFID Journal 15 years ago. Uh, it seemed very obvious that RFID was the ideal technology for solving uh, all of these problems. Uh, it enables tracking of unique items, so you can tell one gurney from another and not miscount them because you, you, you counted the same one twice. Um, it requires little or no labor costs. So uh, if you're using a handheld, that greatly reduces the amount of time to take inventory, uh, you know, of say thousands of items in a in a cabinet, a medical cabinet, for example. Um, but in many cases, you don't even need labor. You you simply uh, count the things automatically. Uh, many hospitals now have. Um, uh, smart cabinets that, that have real-time inventory of uh, everything in the cabinet. You can see that in real time with no labor whatsoever. RFID is relatively inexpensive. Um, it's certainly not uh, cheap, uh, but it's relatively inexpensive. Um, I often hear people say, well, it's much more expensive than a barcode, and I say that's absolute nonsense because um, when you talk about the cost of a barcode versus the 
cost of an RFID tag, you're really talking about the cost of the data carrier. Um, the data carrier itself is not very useful. What's important is the data. And to get the data off of a, a barcode, you almost always need a human being to scan a barcode. Um, and as I said, with RFID, in some cases, you, you have no labor whatsoever. Um, and when you think about this, the proof that, that RFID is cheaper than barcodes is companies like Macy's are now doing inventory counts once every two weeks, uh, where they used to do counts twice a year with barcodes. Um, so it's far cheaper to take inventory uh, with RFID than with, uh, than with barcodes in, in some cases. So the question is, was I right? Uh, was I right in terms of uh, every item being manufactured with an embedded RFID tag or having a tag placed on it? Um, so far, I think the, the, the votes would say uh, I, my prediction is not looking very good. Um, you know, if you um, think about the world today and the number of items manufactured with RFID in them or on them, um, it's a very, very small number. And if you think Think about the number of stores. I mean, one of the hottest areas is retail, um, and yet if you if you look at the number of stores that are using RFID, um, I would guess it's probably less than one percent of the stores around the world um, have an RFID system for managing inventory. So just a little bit about the size of the market and just to, to give some perspective on it. And, and I'm not here to sort of run down the industry. Obviously, I'm a big part of the industry and I've been working very hard to grow the industry. But, um, you know, I want to put things in some perspective. So ABI Research, ID TechX, and other research firms estimate that the RFID industry is about $10 billion globally. Now, that's not small. That's a pretty significant chunk of change. Um, but when you think about it, it's smaller than the market for wearable computers, the smaller than the market for smartwatches and other devices like that. Um, so, you know, the, the wearable market has been, you know, percolating for a while, but it's a relatively new market, and yet it's uh, already gone uh, way beyond the RFID, or it's, or it's equal to the, the RFID industry. Um, just again, to kind of put the, the size of the market into some context, um, it, you know, 10 billion is great, and if you sell tags or you make the chips that go in the tags, um, you, you're, you're selling to a lot of different companies, um, but a lot of systems integrators and, and solution providers have focused on industries. And if you divide 20 billion by the 40 or so industries that are adopting RFID, um, that's about $250 million per industry globally. And if you divide that by 250 companies, um, it's, sorry, 250 companies, that's uh, actually a million, being, not 10 million, it's a million being invested in each industry uh, in each country. And a million dollars is not a significant investment. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that only a million dollars is being invested in retail in the U.S. and a million dollars is being uh, invested in a re retail in, um, in Mongolia and every other country on Earth. Um, some industries are much larger than, than that and some are much smaller than that. But the point is um, that the state of adoption is still in, in, its, in its infancy. So two questions I ask, and again, RFID Journal has been in business for 15 years, writing about RFID, writing about success stories. We've written um, thousands of stories uh, highlighting uh, successful deployments of RFID technology. Um, so why is RFID not growing more rapidly? That's question number one. And question number two is, why, will RFID always remain a niche technology? Is this just the way it's always going to be? So let's take a look at the technology adoption life cycle. So, so this comes right out of Jeffrey Moore's book. And um, if you are a regular reader of my opinion column, you know that I am a big fan of Jeffrey Moore. Um, I, I've, I've read all his books. And um, the reason I'm a big fan of Jeffrey Moore is when I read Crossing the Chasm, and I only read it about five years ago. I wish I'd read it, read it 15 years ago. Um, but when you when you look at what he says in the book 
everything he says is what I see in the RFID market every day. Um, I have never seen something where I say, wow, that, that contradicts what Jeffrey Moore would predict. Never. Um, so in my mind, when somebody lays out a, a, a scenario uh, that, that you see playing out in real time, and, uh, you, you know, it, it makes you believe that, 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 uh, that he's right. So Jeffrey Moore basically said that, you know, the, the market is divided uh, into these sections. So early on, you have innovators. And early on, we had uh, Walmart, for example, jumping on the RFID bandwagon, announcing even before there was a global RFID standard that it was going to require its um, uh, largest customers to tag pallets and cases. Um, then you have sort of the early market uh, kind of the, the 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 visionaries. Actually, perhaps Walmart is more in the in the visionary uh, category. Um, but then you then you uh, so, so so what Moore said was um, in the old days people believed that you know these visionaries would show the way and then other companies would say oh I see that visionary has used this new technology to achieve benefits I will go and adopt and use uh, 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 use the same thing so. So um, that seems to make sense, right? So if a retailer, a uh, visionary retailer uses a technology and says, oh, you know, this is delivering benefits and stories are being written in publications like RFID Journal saying uh, this company is saving money, cutting costs, improving inventory accuracy, whatever, others will follow on. And, and what Jeffrey Moore said was we saw um, the opposite happen. What, what, what happened was suddenly the market disappeared. We went from having uh, some growth in these startup companies to suddenly there was no market. And he couldn't figure it out. He couldn't figure out why companies with good technology were failing because they would run out of money uh, when, this, when the market suddenly dried up. And what he realized was, as he did his research and started to study this phenomenon, that there was a chasm between the early adopters, the visionaries, and the early majority, the pragmatists. And the pragmatists n not only don't jump on a new technology that a visionary's proven, they actually, uh, according to Jeffrey Moore, are very suspicious of the visionaries. They, they think the visionaries are a little nutty and, uh, and, and risk takers, and they're not risk takers. And they want to be, they, they want to use a technology that's proven and safe and secure. And so the market falls off after these visionaries all adopt and, and, and you, you get a little bit of adoption, uh, the market suddenly disappears um, and you go into the chasm. And then, um, then what happens is very important. You see companies that have a problem that is so serious and no other technology can solve it, so they turn to the new technology uh, to solve that business problem. And that happens over and over and over again to the point where the technology begins to mature, the solutions become more mature, the, the technology is more proven, and you start to get the early majority to say, okay, now this is a practical solution. It's not high risk. It's, it's not something I have to highly customize for my organization. And adoption begins to grow. And that's sort of where we are now. We're out of the chasm, adoption starting to grow. And of course, at some point, you hit a tipping point, um, and then the market goes into the tornado phase. Actually, the bowling, you know, one market tornadoes, which means one market goes from to mass adoption, um, and then other markets follow, and that's the bowling alley stage, um, and then and then you you get to mass adoption. So that's that's the technology adoption life cycle in a in a nutshell. Now Jeffrey Moore says that there are um, uh, five conditions that must exist. Uh, for a technology, any technology, but specifically in this case RFID, to cross the chasm. And the first one is a global standard. There must be a global standard. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a 
ISO blessed standard, it can be a de facto standard. So for music, um, MP3s became a de facto standard. There's no, there wasn't any blessing from an international organization, um, but everybody just simply said this is the best format, and everybody kind of went along with it. In some industries in the RFID world, uh, there are there are uh, standards in in that. Um, l let me clarify. There are there are standards in in all industries, and there are standards for RFID. Um, but in some industries, end users agree on what standards should be used, and in some industries, they don't. So, for example, in the apparel sector and retail apparel, um, almost all retailers are using passive UHF RFID. Um, provides the, the read range they want and 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 uh, and so on um, in other industries there's less agreement so for example I talked about tracking medical equipment with a real-time location system well um, some companies uh, some hospitals are using um, active RFID uh, based on the Wi-Fi standard so some are using uh, active tags that use Zigbee. Some are using active tags that are uh, proprietary. Some are using ultrasound. So there's a variety of options out there, and, and companies have cho hospitals have chosen different ones. And that makes it more risky for other hospitals to jump on board because I don't want to deploy a Zigbee system if Wi-Fi is going to dominate and, I, and vice versa. So um, there needs to be a global standard and agreement on what that standard is for our application in our industry. There needs to be a problem that no other technology can solve, and I would just um, uh, add uh, to Jeffrey Moore's comment that n that no other technology can solve cost effectively. So um, you could put a QR code on everything and go around and scan it all the time, uh, with a, have a person scan it, but y you, it would be very expensive to um, have lots of people going around scanning everything all the time. So, so uh, a problem no other technology can solve there needs to be a whole product, um, and by that he talks about an integrated solution. Um, <clears throat> in the early days of digital music, you had to go buy a DVD ripper, uh, and you had to buy some software to get your music off of a DVD and onto your uh, computer. Uh, then you needed to um, get some software to copy your songs onto an MP3 player and you need to buy the hardware separately. Apple came along and said, forget all that. We have, uh, you, you put, you, you'll put your CD into your iMac, uh, your iMac will recognize that it's a, a music CD, ask you if you want to copy the songs to your iTunes library, you say yes, you arrange your playlists on your, on your uh, iTunes uh, software, and then you copy everything to your iPod and you have your playlists on your iPod. Very simple, integrated, and sales of MP3 players exploded when, when they created this integrated product. So um, that's an important uh, uh, thing that's required. And then there needs to be a critical mass of end users um, who uh, are adopting the technology. And once you get that critical mass, more and more people come on. There becomes a, there becomes a, 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 a benefit to being using the same technology that others are using. And there needs to be a gorilla that the market can, can embrace. And a gorilla, in Jeffrey Moore's term, is a dominant technology player. So in the, in the MP3 players, Apple became the gorilla selling uh, billions, millions and millions of, of iPods every year. And it became the, 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 the sort of dominant player in the market. And the reason that's important is because it makes the purchase or investment decision so much easier. Um, there's an old saying that many people know, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And the thing is, it's safe to buy an IBM mainframe computer, or it was, and so everyone kind of just defaulted to that. And that's a big thing for companies. If, if I go out and invest in an RFID system that no one else is using and it doesn't work, I may get fired. But if I invest in the RFID system that my competitors are all using, then, then even if we have a problem with it, um, I can say to my boss, look, this is what everybody else is using this is the standard you know we, we, we had to go with this so 
of these five conditions, uh, retail is the closest to, to achieving all of them. Um, so there is a global standard, as I said, everybody agrees that passive UHF is the, uh, is the solution that, uh, that they should be using. There's a problem no other technology can solve. Yes, uh, inventory accuracy uh, is a problem that all retailers share and, um, and, and RFID can solve it. Uh, is there a whole product? Not quite yet. There are some companies that are kind of banding together to, to go to market together. Um, we're seeing that start start to happen and, and that's creating a, a uh, the emergence of whole products. Um, I don't think we're completely there yet. Um, and there's no technology gorilla yet. We, 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 you know, there's no, there's no one company or one group of companies uh, that everybody's turning to and we're not quite at cl critical mass. So what I see happening in retail is uh, somebody will come up uh, with a, a, a whole product easily deployed, a way to tag up stores, a uh, way to tag up inventory. Um, that company will gain more and more business. They will start to become the technology gorilla um, and more and more companies will jump on that bandwagon, bandwagon will get to critical mass and uh, eventually we will see all apparel tracked with, um, with RFID in retail. Uh, so just, you know, there isn't a whole product, I just went through this. Um, there's still too much complexity in uh, solutions. This is what I hear from the end users. Um, each installation still often has to be customized, which makes it harder to uh, roll out technology uh, to, to hundreds and hundreds of stores. Um, and as long as this is the case, adoption will be um, on a case-by-case -case basis. So a lot of retailers don't feel that they're compelled to deploy an RFID solution today. They say, oh, I can wait. I have uh, other things that are higher priorities. I want to uh, redo my SAP system or whatever. Um, so that's a big issue. Another big issue is that the market is not transparent. Um, Retailers and end users across all industries don't know which companies offer which products and which solutions. Um, in a recent RFID journal survey, a majority of retailers working on RFID for more than four years could only identify four RFID solution providers focused on retail. Now think about that for a minute. XYZ retailer has been researching RFID for more than four years and we only can name four companies that we know deliver RFID and retail products. That's part of the issue. Another problem is that, is that the solution providers often ignore potential customers. Um, we have companies requesting product information and they don't get an answer from RFID vendors. I once um, had a company contact me. Uh, they had read a story about a deployment in a steel factory. They were a steel factory in, um, in Israel and they wanted to get it cut in touch with um, the, the company that did that deployment. I emailed a person I knew there got no response. I emailed another person there, I got no response. I emailed the CEO, I got no response. And then finally I went back to, the, to, to the, my reader and said, I'm sorry, um, I can't get anybody to respond to me. Uh, and this is very, very frustrating. Um, sometimes vendors tell me that they don't want to be bothered with uh, a small deployment. So, uh, for example, mid-size company here on Long Island was interested in, in tracking some of their, um, uh, some of the goods in their warehouse. They have about $4 million in inventory and I reached out to a couple of companies and they said, it's too small, we're not really that interested. Um, the problem with that is, I, look, I understand that companies have to make decisions about where they invest their time and their resources, um, but from a market adoption perspective, the problem with that is not only does that company not use RFID, um, but any companies that would have learned from them 
uh, won't use RFID. So if they did, if they did do the deployment uh, and we wrote about it, um, then people would hear about that and say maybe that would work for us because we're similar to those guys, and maybe those guys would speak at a local chamber of commerce meeting to other companies or speak at an industry event about how they used RFID, and that would encourage adoption. If they don't do it, um, they can't speak about it, obviously, and and others can't learn from them. Uh, I also believe that small deployments uh, will grow into big deployments. And uh, one of the problems in the RFID industry is that we don't have um, good, simple solutions that people can just uh, buy off the shelf, use, and get get interested in. So um, I had a company, uh, Komatsu, which is the big Japanese earth-moving company. Um, they contacted me and they wanted to get just a simple RFID reader and some tags, tag some stuff in their factory, um, have the, the, the reader output to a flat file um, and, and just, or an Excel spreadsheet and be able to, to take uh, deployments. And I've contacted people about a solution like this and um, the answer I get is no, we're not interested in something like that because if they have a problem with the reader, we're going to be doing support, so we're going to spend, we're going to get a $2,000 sale and then we're going to be doing you know support constantly for these guys and my answer to that is again I understand companies have to make decisions about how they use their resources um, but I believe that if that company used RFID for this simple solution it would grow into a bigger solution and maybe their entire warehouse would be outfitted um, and maybe other warehouses would eventually be outfitted and maybe they would deploy RFID on a very large scale given the size of the company um, but if we never get the, the RFID technology in their hands then it doesn't start and the, the deployment doesn't grow. Jeffrey Moore says if, that it's important to focus on uh, companies that uh, have a compelling business problem. And I would say over the last, um, uh, I, I would say RFID went into the chas chasm around uh, 2007, and, um, and, and since then, um, I would say most of the people who read RFID Journal, most of the people who come to our events are people who have a compelling business problem. Um, they've looked for solutions elsewhere. Um, they've done some research on Google. They found RFID. They found us. Um, and now they're looking at RFID as a, um, as a, a solution to their problem. Um, I think there are lots of people out there in this boat, lots of people with business problems. Um, they contact me all the time. Um, they read RFID Journal all the time. We have you know, 100,000 people coming to the website um, every month. I think we're doing a poor job of servicing uh, this group's need. I think we're focused on uh, not getting that guy who's got a problem like the company on Long Island and solving it, uh, but rather going out and looking for um, you know, the sale to the big oil company that's going to be a, a multi-million dollar sale. Um, and I think that uh, you know, if you go out, if you go out looking for big numbers um, and you ignore the the ones and twos, uh, I don't think that that leads to growth. I think that uh, you start with the ones and twos, and then they they those solutions grow and um, start to get bigger. So. Uh, I'm going to make another prediction, and I predict that RFID will not remain a niche technology. I still uh, believe what I believed many years ago. Um, I think some company will build a whole product that's relatively easy to use, easy to deploy, and delivers the data retailers, manufacturers, logistics providers, and others need. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that they will uh, become the gorilla. And it could be uh, one of the companies or groups of companies that are out there today, uh, big names, companies that we all know, or it could be um, some, some guy in a garage. Um, I talk to a lot of the, the researchers uh, in, in universities, and there's lots of interesting uh, developments going on there. But eventually, I think uh, what we're going to see is apparel is going to hit uh, critical mass. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's ideal for RFID, lots of different uh, complex SKUs, hard to manage inventory, uh, RF friendly. Uh, so I think retail apparel is going to be the first to adopt, um, and adoption will ramp up dramatically. Um, I, 
I think that this is significant not just because it will increase the number of tags being consumed every year, the number of readers being sold, um, and the number of deployments being done, but I think it's also significant because um, CEOs will begin to see RFID technology in action. So um, I would say less than 1%, maybe maybe less than one-tenth or one one-hundredth of a percent of CEOs have ever seen an RFID system work. Um, right. And when I show it to them, when I when when they see it, um, you know, they, they, their mouths drop open. Um, so I I envision a, a day when um, lots of CEOs are going into buy new suits and dresses and outfits for uh, for work, and they see people taking inventory of 10,000 items in the men's department or uh, the women's shoe department in five minutes. Um, and I think that's a transformational change for the RFID industry. I think what's going to happen is uh, they're going to realize they've got lots of physical objects that they don't do a good job of managing, uh, and they're going to want to use RFID to do it. So that will show co folks that RFID has matured, uh, it's ready from ha for prime time, that there are whole products out there. Um, I think it's, it's, it's power, it will be self-evident when you see it. Um, and I think a lot of companies will, will begin to embrace. I would say we've already seen um, companies in other industries coming into the database in larger numbers due, in my view, to the fact that there have been a lot of positive stories about uh, big deployments at Macy's um, and Kohl's and, and other companies. So I think first thing that will happen is RFID will spread to other retail categories. Um, so from apparel, you can go to electronics where they also have lots of SKUs. There are 50,000 electronic stores just in the U.S. alone. Actually, these numbers are old. You can see there it's the 2002 economic consensus. Uh, those were the numbers I could find online. 150,000 food and beverage stores, 41,000 general merchandise stores, 82,000 pharmacy and health products stores, 50,000 auto parts dealers. Um, that's a lot of uh, retail outlets and a lot of RFID readers uh, and a lot of tags that can be consumed. So once retail goes, and again, we're seeing, uh, I didn't put down sporting goods here, uh, but we're seeing a lot of sporting goods companies now starting to do RFID. We've written about Decathlon, Sports Zone. There are others out there doing research. Um, so you're going to see uh, these other retail categories, uh, jewelry, start to adopt. So the result of all this adoption in retail will be the hardware prices will fall, performance will continue to improve. Uh, I think the RFID industry has done a great job of investing in hardware and, and software and making um, making the solutions better. You know, I never hear people complain that they get t dead tags anymore or tags can't be read. Um, the, the, the technology has improved dramatically, um, but with more revenue uh, comes more innovation and, 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 and uh, improve even greater improvements in the product. Um, so I think there will be more software solutions out there. Um, RFID will get easier to deploy, and it, it will be possible to track and manage everything with RFID. So how long will this take? Um, that's uh, the, 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 the $100 million question. So um, it really depends on the community. I think the first company to create a whole product in retail, uh, to, to market it specifically to the retailers ready to deploy as opposed to the retailers who are not interested in RFID, um, to build market share uh, even with small companies will win big. I think they'll get to uh, mass adoption fairly quickly. Um, just a, a point, you know, Jeffrey Moore says that the gorilla gets to 70% of the market. So the first one there, um, there's a big, big payoff. Um, this quote I put in here because it's sort of uh, an astonishing quote that, that someone said to me um, Back, I would say, four years ago, maybe five years ago, uh, someone in Europe came up to me. Uh, they were an RFID reader manufacturer, and they said, we're not going to be the gorilla. And I thought that was really very, very interesting uh, because um, in Silicon Valley, 
uh, every kid uh, in his garage thinks that he's going to be the gorilla. And here's a company that's manufacturing readers. They're well-known readers. They're they're good, and um, and this company is saying we're not going to be the gorilla. Uh, I, 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 it's unusual uh, for technology companies to think that way, but someone's going to be the gorilla. And uh, again, it could be someone working in their garage or presenting uh, an, I, an IEEE paper um, at an IEEE event. Um, but everyone in the industry is waiting for that company, that person, that group of companies to lead the way and, uh, and drive us to mass adoption. I think we'll get there. Um, I think, you know, whether that easy to deploy uh, product is out there now and is just waiting to reach critical mass or it's um, coming uh, in a year or coming in four years, that, that's very, very difficult to say. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I do believe, uh, I'm certain, uh, somebody will come up with a product that will um, blow the market away and RFID will, 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 will take off and things will really, um, will really start to store, soar. So that's my presentation. And uh, Mike, if you want to uh, take questions, I'd be happy to do that. All right, great. Thank you, Mark, for the great presentation. And I do have a few questions. Uh, we'll start off with what are the biggest mistakes RFID companies are making in terms of growing their business and the market? Um, well, I would say one of the biggest mistakes is um, focusing on the wrong people. Um, uh, you know, as Jeffrey Moore said, there are people who have a compelling business problem that no other technology can solve, and those people are ready and willing and eager to invest in RFID. Um, and then there are other people who um, are, may have the same problem but don't feel it's as burning an issue and are not looking for a solution to it and are not interested in RFID. And Yes, they could benefit from RFID, so I understand why sales guys think they can convince them of that, um, but it's very, very difficult. I rarely see that happen. I, I see the adoption come from the companies that recognize they have a problem. Johnson Control recognized they had a problem with containers, and they tried everything, uh, but finally they realized that RFID was the only technology that could solve that problem. So, so that's the biggest issue, and I think the second issue would be to, to be uh, that, that a lot of companies seem to be unwilling or skeptical of marketing. And I think that that in general is a, is a mistake. And I know it's not easy to market RFID products and services because um, the vast majority of people right now are not interested in investing in them, though they will be one day. Um, and how do you find the right person that's going to be interested in your product? Um, so they may have tried marketing and, and it didn't work. Um, but if you uh, don't market, if you have a great product and you don't tell anybody about it, um, your company's not going to grow and the industry is not going to grow. So that's a, that's a problem. And we've struggled. Uh, we've worked very hard and invested in some very innovative systems to try to make it possible to target the right person uh, at the right time with a very low-cost advertising option. Uh, unfortunately, even if the cost is only $100, for some reason, companies seem skeptical and they, they don't want to try it. And I think, I, I believe that there have been companies that have gone out of business, and I would say that if they had spent $1,000 in advertising with us, uh, there's a good chance they'd still be in business. I can't guarantee that, but I know we have readers. I know they're interested. I know we can target them. Um, I think there's business out there um, if, you're willing to, if you're willing to spend a little bit of money to, to find it. Very interesting. Another question, other than retail, what are the next largest industries for RFID? Next largest. Well, the next largest is manufacturing, and manufacturing has always been RFID Journal's largest readership base and attendee base at our events. 
The problem with manufacturing is it's different from retail in this sense. All retailers, all apparel retailers have the same problem, inventory accuracy. Inventory accuracy in, in, in the average retail apparel store is 65%. So to deploy an RFID system, everyone is going to deploy it for the same re reasons initially. Um, or most, most are going to deploy it for the same reasons initially. Um, in manufacturing, the applications are way more varied and the needs are way more varied. So, for example, one manufacturer may struggle with shipping accuracy and they may say, I want to deploy an RFID system to improve my shipping accuracy. Okay, that's great. Another retailer may, uh, sorry, another manufacturer may say, I have a problem tracking my work in process. I want to deploy a system to track my work in process. Okay, good. Another one may say, you know what, we're always losing our tools. Uh, I want to track our tools. So the result of this is that you don't have the same kind of commonality in the applications that you have in retail. So it's much harder to get to critical mass in manufacturing than it is in retail where everybody is pretty much focused on the same, the same issue. So I would say manufacturing is a huge one, um, but there are many, many industries. We're tracking 40 industries now, and, and, and we started out with about 25, and then over time, we, we, you know, more and more people jumped in, and, and, and we saw, for example, more construction companies coming into the database. So we added construction. Uh, we saw weight, more waste management and environmental companies coming in, so we started to uh, include those. We recently, we've seen security companies coming in, so we've added that. So there are lots of different industries. And, you know, I said the gorilla gets 70% of the market. Um, and that's true, but if you're a small company today and you have some expertise in, let's say, the uh, waste management industry, and you offer a, a very tailored solution, um, you don't make the tags and readers, but you, you make the software, um, you source the tags and the readers for, for companies, you deploy the solution, you could be the dominant player in the, in, the, in the waste management company, in the waste management industry, and that could be a $100 million business business for somebody if if all the waste management companies start to adopt RFID. So there's huge opportunities uh, for individual players to, to dominate individual markets. I think there's going to be a there's going to be a tag uh, gorilla, there's going to be a reader gorilla, um, maybe more than one, but there's also going to be uh, software and solution provider gorillas in particular industries, and you may have nothing to do with the retail sector, but you may dominate a different sector. Okay, uh, another question. Is there a UHF dongle for a smartphone? Yes, uh, there's several of them on the market uh, that you can plug into uh, a smartphone. The Mini-Me you can buy on Amazon.com. Um, there are there are others uh, others out there. There are um, sleds that you can um, slide your phone into and turn them into a reader. Depends on uh, exactly what you're trying to achieve. Okay, and another question. Are there industries like retail that lend themselves to a single solution? For instance, does healthcare have mostly the same problem to solve? Um, so I think you have to divide, well, you have to divide the healthcare market into two, two separate things, uh, in my view. Um, so, um, and, and, and this, this is probably true of manufacturing and, and other sectors as well. Um, I, I think of, a, 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 of healthcare as having a long read range market and a short read range market. And by that I mean every healthcare company, every hospital and clinic has a problem tracking um, medical equipment, mobile medical equipment, these are oxygen pumps, gurneys, wheelchairs, um, uh, the defibrillators, these kinds of things, uh, um, 
uh, incubators. These kinds of mobile equipment that can move from room to room, uh, they have a hard time tracking them over long distances. So you could use an active system. I was going to say you could divide it between active and passive, um, although I think with uh, the advent of, of overhead passive UHF readers, you could possibly, uh, you can do real-time location with, with um, passive now as well. Uh, but so long, so, so there's this huge market, they all share this problem, absolutely tracking their medical equipment. They all share another problem, and that is tracking high value uh, things over short distances uh, and maintaining inventory of high value goods where, where you're probably reading over a short distance. And by that I mean, so you have pharmaceutical drugs. Some drugs cost um, $100 a pill. So you need to track these, you need to have good inventory accuracy, you need to take counts regularly. Um, RFID is ideal for that. You have implants, the stents that cost $10,000, pacemakers, things of that sort that get stored in inventory that you want to track um, in, 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 you know, over the short range and take inventory frequently. So yes, I think that healthcare is an ideal market because they do have um, many of the same problems um, and there are companies out there that are trying to address that. So um, uh, Cardinal Health purchased an RFID company um, and they've offered a, a passive HF solution for tracking stents and other implantables uh, so you can take inventory accuracy very, very quickly. So um, yes, I do think that, that healthcare has that, that characteristic. Okay, great. And I'm going to conclude with this question. What are your thoughts on RFID as an anti-counterfeiting solution? Well, I think it's uh, an excellent uh, uh, opportunity to, to decrease counterfeiting, um, and we certainly see some folks doing that. A lot of what's happening with RFID and anti-counterfeiting is not written about in RFID journal because the companies, the high-end companies that make uh, handbags that cost $2,000, $3,000, they don't want to tip off the counterfeiters to what they're doing. But RFID has uh, a number of characteristics that help with counterfeiting. One is that you could have a unique serial number and track chain of custody over, for example, drugs. Today, if you wanted to um, uh, track drugs individually using barcodes, you would need uh, an army of workers to scan barcodes constantly every time uh, uh, drugs change hands. So, so the manufacturers may sell to a distributor like a Cardinal Health, and Cardinal may sell to sub-distributors, or they may sell directly and deliver directly to stores. Um, these things change hands. You need to track that, and RFID allows you to do that very, very quickly take those counts, track the individual items, confirm that they were supposed to be received, check back, you know, that, that this was the right item shipped to the right location, um, and if it has a different serial number, maybe it's counterfeit. There are also ways now of uh, authenticating tags, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with uh, encryption. And so these are more sophisticated tags, um, but they allow you to uh, make it much harder to clone a tag. You can't just simply create an RFID tag, write uh, a, a serial number to it and say it's the same as, as every other tag that's being produced by a different company uh, and, and counterfeit that way. So, so the authentication factor makes it much, much harder to counterfeit. And I think that, um, you know, when you combine the ability to do inventory uh, very quickly, to authenticate, uh, to reduce theft, when you add these things up, the, the, the return on investment for retailers and others, I believe, is, uh, is astronomical. It's better than anything out there. And again, this is why I'm so bullish on, on the technology uh, not being a niche technology. All right, great. Well, thank you, Mark, for your insight and knowledge and for providing us with this presentation today. Thank you to our audience for their active participation. I hope that you all found this information to be valuable. We would appreciate your feedback, so please take the time to complete a brief session evaluation, which will be sent out to you all shortly. This information will be used to develop the future presentations in our AIM webinar series and future AIM Inc. events. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you.